Now, one important person who could not be with us here today, but who sends his greetings, is President Mikhail Gorbachev. I'd like to begin our conference by reading a message from him that arrived at our offices just yesterday. Quote, I would like to convey my greetings to the participants in the conference commemorating the events of 1989, the year that became a turning point in the ending of the Cold War. The fact that you are meeting at the Reagan Library is meaningful and has profound symbolic importance. President Reagan was our main partner in the difficult work of overcoming the confrontation between Russia and America, the East and the West. It is that work that has earned Ronald Reagan a well-deserved place of honor among the great American presidents. He goes on, as years go by, I see more fully the historic role of Ronald Reagan. He showed truly great political and human qualities as a representative of the American people. In the coming years, America will continue to bear the burden of great responsibility in world affairs. The potential of American leadership is far from exhausted. However, its leadership will have to be exercised through partnership with other nations. During the years at Ronald Reagan's presidency, our two nations became partners in ridding the world from fear. History will remember this. So as President Gorbachev has said, we are gathered here to commemorate a truly historic event, the 20th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the advent of freedom and democracy in Central and Eastern Europe. Today, countless people around the world enjoy greater freedom, more economic prosperity, and better lives as a result of President Reagan's leadership, and it is that leadership that we will celebrate today. We will begin this morning with a panel of some of President Reagan's closest advisors who will look at his lifelong battle to challenge communism on every front. We will hear how President Reagan fought that battle, how he helped to bring down the wall, and how he helped bring the Cold War to an end without firing a shot. We will then hear from President Reagan's Secretary of State of almost eight years, Secretary George Shultz. In his keynote address at lunch, Secretary Shultz will offer his personal reflections on behind-the-scenes negotiations and the instrumental role that Ronald Reagan played in the fall of the Berlin Wall. Secretary Schultz is uniquely qualified to provide us with insight on what the world would be like today if not for President Reagan's determination to advance the cause of global freedom. This afternoon, we will turn our focus to the continuing and unfolding story of democracy and free enterprise in Central and Eastern Europe. In our first panel this afternoon, leaders of the fight against communism join with leaders still working to establish economic opportunity and democratic self-government in the region. Together, they will reflect on what the fall of the wall achieved and what remains undone. And then we will end our day as our final panel of distinguished scholars and participants in the triumph from both the East and the West offer their perspectives on why the wall fell and what its end meant for nations on both sides of the old divide. Now, the Reagan Foundation is proud to have partnered with the Heritage Foundation to bring you this event. For many years, the Heritage Foundation has served as one of our nation's largest and most respected public policy research institutes. We are honored to have their president with us today as a co-host for this conference, Dr. Ed Fulmer. I'd like to invite Dr. Fulmer to the stage for a few remarks before we begin this morning's panel. Dr. Fulmer. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary, General Meese, Excellencies, distinguished guests all, August 11th, 1961, 61, I was a college undergraduate with a group of my friends. We were camping out on our first trip ever to Europe. We were in a campsite in Bavaria. The next morning, we planned to take our Volkswagen microbus up the Autobahn to Berlin. We woke up the next morning, and all plans were off. During the night, the wall went up. 
commemorating today the 20th anniversary of the wall coming down is very, very special for me. I was there when it went up. It's a moving tribute to our nation's 40th president that this conference has attracted so many vital individuals who were so much involved in the activities that led up to this and who understand the significance of Ronald Reagan's exceptional role in the changing world order in the collapse of worldwide communism. Today's program promises to be both stimulating and refreshing as we revisit recent history with the accuracy and the acumen it deserves but does not always receive. Today we will hear from an esteemed gallery of scholars, writers, and public figures, past and present. And I must pause and just say to my friend from the Czech Republic who has stood so strong and so firm on so many issues, thank you, President Klaus, for everything you continue to do. I've known you for a long time. And We are going to reinforce the truth about Ronald Reagan's hand in the creation of the world that we still live in today, a world where America not only exists as the sole superpower, but where the liberal, open, democratic system exists as the most just and virtuous form of social organization on earth. Our speakers will be memorializing not only the dismantling of the Berlin Wall, but more important, the precise reasons it ultimately fell in what that moment meant and continues to mean for the rest of the world. By continuing to re-examine this precious milestone, we help to guarantee that the Cold War, its victims, its players, its climax, and its legacy is a permanent lesson not only for Americans but for everyone around the world. Contrary to some political leaders, the wall did not come down because the world stood as one. The wall came down because the free world stood down the world of totalitarianism. After 50 years, the West, led by an America under Ronald Reagan, ended Marxist totalitarianism. As he said, one side won, the other lost. For everyone in the world, the victor was freedom. The beneficiaries were not only German, but half a billion men, women, and children from Poland, from the Baltics, from the Czech Republic, all the way to Siberia. To conclude, let me quote German Chancellor Angela Merkel in her address to Congress four days ago. She said, the freedom bell in Berlin is, like the liberty bell in Philadelphia, a symbol which reminds us that freedom does not come about of itself. It must be struggled for and then defended anew every day of our lives. We are here to remember that today. I look forward to the program. Thank you all for being here. So without further ado, we will begin with our first panel. John? Oh, so he's going to call us now? Uh, good morning. Come on down. My name is John McCaslin. I have been a journalist. Uh, well, let me put it this way. In 1984, at the age of 27, I was covering Ronald Reagan's White House, and I used to fly on that plane. And uh, you talk about a thrill for somebody at that age. Uh, I will never forget, believe it or not, the computer era entered about four years before that, as far as journalists were concerned. And I was stunned when I had to do a pool report upon arrival here in Los Angeles for New Year's Eve at the Annenberg Estate out in Palm Springs. When Larry Speaks, then press secretary, sat me down at a little manual typewriter on that plane. 
And I didn't know how to type on a manual typewriter. I mean, it was like this. You had to punch it to even make a letter. And I'll never forget that trip, and I think I was the reason that a, what was called then a portable bubble got put on that plane, which was more the keyboard that we were used to. But these emotions overflow as I come into this incredible library and museum, and I thank everybody for allowing me to moderate this first panel. I'd like to say something about Fred Ryan, the chairman of the Reagan Library and Museum, who of course was one of President Reagan's top aides. We all know with the pub over there, and by the way, I've written uh, a political column in Washington for 20 plus years, and now I've gone back into broadcast. But my column was basically more of the personal side of the leaders of the nation's capital and around the world, things we don't normally read. And the real story behind that pub is this. President Reagan went there in 1984, the same year I was covering uh, the White House, and uh, had a pint of beer, as you can see in the pictures there, while he was visiting Ireland. And Fred, uh, whose daughter Genevieve is here today, they went back 10 years later, in 2004, uh, to visit this pub where Fred had been 10 years before with the president. And he was very surprised to find that the pub was closed when he and his family descended on it that day. And uh, as often the case in Ireland, the family lives above the pub. And Fred went upstairs and knocked on the door and he said, my name's Fred Ryan, I was with the president, we were here, I'm so sorry that your pub's closed. Well, they were so happy to have Fred and his family there, they went downstairs, they opened the pub up, and then they informed Fred, while his wife and family was out walking around the village, that they had come upon some hard times or for other personal family reasons, had to close the pub down. And while Fred's wife, Ginny, was out walking around the village, Fred pulled out his checkbook wrote a check, and purchased the pub. When his wife came back from his walk, he said, honey, you're not going to believe this, but we're now pub owners. <laughs> and Fred told me that story. I was delighted to write about it. And the rest is history. Fred had it disassembled, and you now see it here. And by all means, make sure you pay it a visit if you have not yet. Anyway, I would like to, without further ado, introduce our panel, which I know are waiting anxiously to speak. Uh, General Meese, as Ed Fuelner said, we're glad to have you with us. Please come up, sir. Also, Richard Allen uh, was Ronald Reagan's uh, chief foreign policy advisor from 1977 to 1980 and served as President Reagan's first national security advisor from 1981 to 1982. We have John Lehman with us as well, who served as the 65th Secretary of the Navy in the Reagan White House and also Peter Robinson, who I can't wait to tell you more about, who spent six years in the White House from 1982 to 83, as well as chief speechwriter then to Vice President Bush, and later as to Ronald Reagan, and uh, the rest of the story I can't wait to tell. Anyway, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, John. Hello, sir. Hello, good to see you. Good to see you. <clears throat> I promise I'm, I won't talk about myself anymore, but they, uh, my editor called me in in 1985 and he said, uh, you're now going to be leaving the, um, the Reagan White House and going over to the Justice Department to cover that. And I was very upset until they told me that I would be starting the same day that Ed Meese would be starting as Attorney General of the United States. And it was great for me. I went over a few days before Mr. Meese arrived. Uh, I got the last interview with the previous Attorney General and the first interview with Mr. Meese, and it's great to be sitting next to you today, sir. President Ronald Reagan became an outspoken opponent of communism shortly after World War II, continuing this opposition while speaking on policy issues throughout the next three decades. Finally, when elected president in 1980, he was able to devise policies that greatly damaged the Soviet Union's credibility as well as their ability to endure. His record, in short, has a remarkable consistency. I would like to begin by asking panelists to assess how and why President Reagan was able to manifest this consistency, why he, unlike much of the United States political establishment, did not turn towards detente of the 1970s. Mr. Meese, I'd like to start with you. Well, Ronald Reagan had prior to becoming president, uh, literally spent a lifetime in research about communism. Uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in, in uh, 1989 
really was uh, started, the, the road to that event started 40 years earlier when Ronald Reagan was in Hollywood and the communists, uh, Communist Party USA and their agents tried to take over the movie industry uh, to use their, uh, that uh, medium for propaganda and to uh, advance their cause. Uh, Ronald Reagan was elected president of the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, he led the movie industry, the other unions, uh, many of whom, uh, the leaders of whom became his close friends throughout his life. Uh, and literally, they, they defeated the communists from that takeover. And that got him interested uh, in communism. He saw it from a domestic standpoint. And he had a good friend who was the uh, lawyer, the general counsel for the Screen Actors Guild and Ronald Reagan's personal lawyer during much of his life uh, in those days. And uh, he had written a book called The Treaty Trap, uh, How Nations uh, Disregard Treaties. Uh, Larry Bielenson was his name. He also wrote uh, uh, about the subversion uh, and uh, peace and nuclear war. And uh, he, fed, he gave these books to the, to the president and sent him a lot of uh, articles that the president requested during those days. And so he literally spent years studying communism and all aspects of it. And so uh, by the time that he uh, really got into, when he was governor of California, he continued that study and continued his interest and continued speaking about it. And during the 60s, when he was uh, uh, speaking around the country uh, on political matters, he spoke about uh, this problem. Uh, but it was particularly in the 70s that he became very disturbed about the direction in which our country was going. Uh, for one thing, uh, there was a, uh, we were in what was called detente. And uh, true enough to uh, Larry Bielenson's book about the treaty trap, uh, we were obeying the treaties and the Soviets were not. Uh, they were involved in aggression. Uh, they were throughout the world in one way or another, subversion of governments and this sort of thing. Uh, and what particularly bothered Ronald Reagan was uh, two things. Number one, a lot of people, the, the ones you talked about, uh, John, uh, were, were uh, giving the impression that there was a moral equivalency between the way the Soviets operated and the way the, the free world operated. It was just two different styles of government. And uh, this particularly uh, disturbed the president, and also uh, the fact that he felt that we were on the road to losing the Cold War uh, the way that the situation was going. He was also concerned that the pundits in those days were saying that capitalism had peaked and democracy was on its last days uh, as far as being the dominant uh, political uh, wave of the future. And so for all of these reasons, that was the reason that he challenged a sitting president of his own party in 1976. Uh, he had a vision of what the United States ought to do in dealing with the Soviet Union, uh, and that was to utilize all of our resources and the free world's resources, really, together with the United States, military, cultural, political, diplomatic, economic, and as he said to Dick Allen, and Dick can tell you the story a little since he was right there, uh, we should not continue uh, simply to sit side by side, but we should take important steps that the free world would ultimately triumph. Uh, because from the other side, uh, they, were, they were in a battle. Uh, we were more or less just, just lying uh, silent uh, in this battle. We were doing some things, uh, but certainly not anything to contend with what was happening on the other side. And his main concern was for the captive nations and the people under oppression. And he felt he ever, ever got that opportunity uh, that he would try to change that situation. And that's why he sought the presidency in 76 and ultimately gained the presidency in, in 1980. Mr. Allen, could you pick up from there? Good morning, sir. Good morning. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And um, I like very much the way Ed led right into uh, throwing me a soft pitch there so I could answer uh, this question and get a little anecdote off, the, uh, off my chest. I do regret, by the way, that uh, our anticipated co-panelist Martin Anderson could not be with us today because Martin and Annalise Anderson have been the principal um, uh, researchers and writers into uh, the real record uh, and of Ronald Reagan and have helped reestablish a, a reasonable basis for assessing his presidency. It's very important what, the, what, what those two have done. Um, I was Richard Nixon's foreign policy coordinator in 1968. I was quite convinced, had long been a Nixon fan. I left the Hoover Institution to help Mr. Nixon. I didn't anticipate going to the White House with him. I wanted to go back to the Hoover Institution uh, because I was quite happy there. 
And it wasn't to be. Uh, I was asked to serve and, and did. But then uh, I left and came back again in 1971 <laughs> uh, until 1972 in a slightly different capacity in international economic and trade policy. And by then, things had begun to shift. By 1974, the policy of detente, which Ed had referred to, was in full swing. And as a student of diplomacy, I was always uh, intrigued by the word detente. It means simply relaxation of tensions. And it's a useful device for conducting the affairs of nations, to relax tensions. So therefore, it's almost impossible, if not impossible, to be against detente. But then uh, Nixon and Kissinger began to develop it into a type of theology based on the premise that one side was losing and the other side was winning, and it would be best to make the best deal under the circumstances that one could possibly make. That's what led, in large measure, Ronald Reagan's challenge to Gerald Ford in 1976, that is, the elevation of detente as this sort of theology. And I, having been a student of Marxism, Leninism, and international politics, uh, really couldn't abide that. And I helped a little bit in 1976. And early in 1977, I decided, now please don't laugh out loud right away, that I would enter elective politics by running for my governor of my home state, New Jersey. <laughs> you laughed. You ruined it. <laughs> so through the good offices of Peter Hannaford, one of the key aides and idea men for Ronald Reagan over many years, a wonderful fellow, I went out to Pacific Palisades, and there I met the governor one morning in about 10 days after Jimmy Carter had been uh, inaugurated as president. And I said to him, um, Governor, I'm here to ask if you'll come to New Jersey and do a fundraiser for me, and would you sign a couple of fundraising letters? And he said, why, yes, of course. Of course I will. Did you come all the way out here to ask me that? And I said, yes, I did. He said, well, why didn't you just call me? And I said, well, sir, I thought that this would require face-to-face, -face and I should ask you uh, to do this. Why, yes, he said, when are you going back? I said, I'm going back on the red eye tonight. He said, do you want to talk? I have all day free. Do I want to talk? Is the Pope a Catholic? <laughs> of course I want to talk. Amazing. He had all day free. He wanted to talk about foreign policy and national security issues. And over the course of that morning, and it went into the morning, and through lunch, and Nancy arranged for us to have some sandwiches, and we continued to talk on into the afternoon until such time as I thought I had to leave to get back down to LAX to get the red-eye plane home. He had already accomplished my goals of offering to help me. I was overwhelmed by that generosity. And we talked, and I, I felt myself in the presence of the keenest analyst of world affairs that one could possibly imagine. And I had been with a lot of them, having been an academician and with President Nixon and with a lot of um, interesting people over my life. Not in all the details, but here I speak, ladies and gentlemen, about the infrastructure. The basic infrastructure was all in place. And there were details missing. I thought, well, this is interesting. I said, I better get going down to the uh, airport, Governor. And he said, all right, he said, but now, before you leave, I want to say something. And I said, yes, sir. He said, some people say that I'm simplistic, but there's a difference between being uh, simplistic and having simple ideas to complex questions. And I think you can have simple, uh, simple answers, rather, to complex questions. And I think you can do that. I said, yes, sir. He said, so with that in mind, my theory of the Cold War is we win and they lose. What do you think about that? <laughs> <laughs> now, I tried to play two years of football at Notre Dame, 
uh, gave it up as a bad job and had no trouble making the debate team as an undergraduate because a fellow named Paul Horning wanted my job uh, and, and got it. But that single expression, if you will, that, that minute literally changed my life, just like Peter has written a wonderful book uh, of how Ronald Reagan changed his life. And I got on the plane, flew home, had breakfast with Pat, who's my wife, who's here today, and I said, I'm not running for governor of New Jersey. I'm, I'm giving back the money. I'm dissolving my committee. I just heard a man say that he might run for president. I asked him, will you run for president again, or would you ever? Well, he said, I don't know. We'll see. I said to him before I left, I don't know if you will, sir, but if you do, i sure like to be part of your team. So I made that decision. And from 77 and 78, 79 and 80, it was, not only was it a hoot and pleasant, but it was highly constructive. And piece by piece, we put together an organization, uh, Ed's leadership, my other colleagues like, like Martin Anderson on the domestic side, John Lehman, my friend and uh, ally for 45 years since he came to me, uh, came to the Nixon administration with me. We put together a program of action, and that program of action was designed to be implemented on day one. The formulation and crystallization of that came in a manuscript that was handed to Ed and to me in the cocktail lounge in the basement of the Hay Adams Hotel during the transition after the election of Ronald Reagan. An enormous manuscript like that that eventually migrated to publication by the Heritage Foundation. Ed Fulner had put it together called Mandate for Leadership. That was the mandate. In other words, on day one, that administration knew precisely where it wanted to go, and it got there. Well, that size of that manuscript reminds me of the health care bill that we have today. But anyway. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's an insult to heritage. <laughs> yeah, very different direction. But that was for a whole administration. Sure. Uh, let's turn to Navy Secretary John Lehman. Good morning, sir. Well, good morning. And uh, this is really an exciting uh, opportunity to, to think back and to keep, uh, keep alive the understanding of how unique this turning point in history really was because of just what Dick was describing. We, we were blessed with a person who had a fundamental, valid understanding of the world balance of power and what made it tick without being immersed in, in minutia and details. And so I think it's the only administration that came to power with a fully worked out strategy to win the Cold War. I don't think any of us ever expected it to happen uh, as early as it did, including uh, President Reagan. But the, the fact was, on Inauguration Day, thanks to Dick Allen and Bill Casey and Ed and others, there was a comprehensive strategy for our, all of our national security structure, the diplomacy, the military rebuilding, the uh, intelligence efforts, the entire integrated national security. And part of that, of course, was getting the right people in place early. Uh, to give you an example, uh, I, was, I was sworn in as Secretary of the Navy two weeks after the inauguration. The, the Secretary of the Navy in, in the recent Bush administration was sworn in 10 months after the inauguration. And the, today, about 22% of the presidential appointments in the Pentagon are filled. And we're, we're now, you know, almost a year into this administration. The Bush administration, when, when I was on the 9-11 Commission, we found one of the main contributors to the disaster of 9-11 was that all the seats were empty. Uh, the day the attack came, Bush had only filled 20% of his national security team. And thanks to Dick and Ed and Bill Casey, the whole slate of the key transmission belts of presidential policy were in place within a month of 
the president's inauguration. And not only that, but we hit the ground running because we had a fully thought through strategy on what to do and how to use American power to prevent war and bring about the end of the Cold War over the long term. And it was, this was a historic confluence of people because very few presidents have had the benefit of years of uh, tutelage and implementation from a team that he led, that he gave the, the, the grand plan to, and they fleshed it out. And so we had a 600-ship Navy with 15 carrier battle groups. We had the expansion of the Air Force to 35 tactical air wings. We had the implementation of the MX missile program and the B-1. We had a full-blown path, costed out, ready to go. We had a supplemental up uh, before Congress two weeks after the president was inaugurated. And not only that, but it was imp being implemented. And the remarkable thing that is overlooked most frequently is that President Reagan realized that he had not just the Soviet Union as an adversary, but bureaucratic inertia. The permanent government was against his innovations because over the years and decades of, of the passivity in strategy uh, that had gone through a number of uh, administrations, there was a, an ingrained view of the stability of the Cold War, the unwinnability of the Cold War, detente as the only alternative. And so when these new forward strategies were put forward, the, the, the bureaucracy went crazy. NATO, which had for years been built around how much land are we going to give up uh, in the, uh, when the Soviets attack? Will it take them two weeks or three weeks to get to the channel? Then we'll have to go nuclear. Suddenly all this was thrown out the window. And believe me, there was huge resistance and attempts to undermine, stop, block, change. And often, it, 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 the, the appeals were made uh, through uh, non-American NATO sources into the White House, from uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, from the Permanent Diplomatic Corps. And the president never wavered to the extent that we had, the NATO had been for 20 years convinced that we could no longer defend the northern flank. So for 20 years, there had not been a single aircraft carrier deployed ab above what was called the Greenland-Iceland-UK gap, because that would be provocative to the Soviets. It would undermine detente. And so uh, they never went up there. Uh, Dick was able to get the president to sign off on the first massive, we're going to get in your face exercise right away. He wasn't going to say, well, we'll plan for it for the next three years. We had, during the transition and even before, planned a huge exercise with the, the Royal Navy, where we had a very, people who think that the, the special relationship is just you know, propaganda don't know what they're talking about. The fact is that the Royal Navy and the uh, United States Navy, as, they, as the Brits found to their great benefit in the Falklands Island War, are deeply integrated. So we had a, an exercise already planned out. So by September of the first year of the Reagan administration, we put five aircraft carriers and 300 ships up into the Norwegian Sea for the first time. This had been done really since the Second World War. And we started running mock attacks into the Kola Peninsula, right up to the border, and, and to demonstrate to the, to the Soviets that we could do this. You, you try to use your superiority in the North German plain, we are going to kick your ass in the sea. <laughs> That's John. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, the Pentagon went crazy. What? How did this happen? NATO, Bernie Rogers, who was the uh, Supreme Allied Commander, 
went berserk. He made a special trip back to the, what's, what's going on here? The Navy's, uh, the, the, the Royal Navy and the US Navy are gonna start World War III. And of course, Dick had made sure that President Reagan fully had bought off on this well before we launched it. The bureaucrats in the Pentagon and the, the Joint Staff, what the hell is this? <laughs> who, who did this? Well, President Reagan did this. And the, the results were incredible. It turned, the, we now know, and it is difficult to talk about, but I would suggest many of you read a book called Blind Man's Bluff. And it's about, it is alleged in that book that we were tapping the Soviet cables in the Navy. I can neither confirm or deny that this was the case, but that we knew ground truth, not depending on some CIA analysts, but ground truth, what, how they were reacting to this. And in fact, over the next two years, as we ran and built these exercises up stronger and stronger, they pulled their submarines back. They pulled their surface fleet, which was uh, practicing interdicting the sea lines of communication to cut us off from NATO. And they pulled the, the boomers back under the, Soviet, uh, under the uh, Arctic ice cap and moved from an offensive, we are on the move, Brezhnev doctrine, back to a holy cow. We've got to preserve these things. And uh, it, it, it was a transforming uh, set of events run from the president's mind. He was not uh, privy to all of the anti-submarine warfare tactics and the balance of how we use seven layers of defense to deal with the backfire, all those things. That was not his interest. He understood that the way to win the Cold War is to get into the minds of the Soviets and pull out their confidence to let them know that they were going to lose if they use military power. Very incredible. <laughs> About uh, 18 months ago, I wrote that while he is not a household name, Peter Robinson who served for almost five years as a speechwriter to President Reagan, was assigned the task of writing the Gipper's historic 1987 speech at the Berlin Wall, when in no uncertain terms he ordered Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev to tear down this wall. A lot has been written about that speech, how it came about, where those words came from. And last, uh, about two summers ago, with little fanfare, Mr. Robinson wrote in the National Archives publication, Prologue, that before he wrote the famous speech, he had broken from the White House advance team and joined a dozen Berliners of different walks of life for dinner, businessmen, academics, students, and homemakers. One man spoke up that each morning on his way to work, he walked past a guard tower, and the same soldier would gaze down at him through binoculars. That soldier, this is a quote, that soldier and I speak the same language, this man said, we share the same history, but one of us is a zookeeper and the other is an animal, and I am never certain which is which. At which point the gracious dinner hostess grew angry, her face red, pounding her fist, quoting, if this man Gorbachev is serious, he can get rid of this wall. Did I quote you accurately, sir? I believe so, yes. Welcome and good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> May I begin by complimenting the pilot who landed that plane? <laughs> <laughs> Fred Ryan's pub, I also would like to begin by telling one of Ronald Reagan's favorite Irish stories. Uh, man's going through the woods and he hears cries for help, and of course it's a leprechaun trapped under a log. He frees the leprechaun, and the leprechaun says, ah, son, I'll grant you two wishes. So the Irishman thinks for a moment, I can't do an Irish brogue as well as Ronald Reagan could, but bear with me. And um, the Irishman thinks for a moment and says, well, what I'd like for my first wish is a glass of beer that no matter how much you drink, it's always full. He has a glass of beer. He drinks and drinks and drinks. It fills back up. He drinks and drinks, fills back up, drinks, it fills back up. Finally, the leprechaun becomes impatient and says, son, I've got places to go. What's your second wish? 
And the Irishman says, I'll have another one of these. <laughs> <laughs> Just to give you some little insight to how much fun it was to meet in the Oval Office, we begin with one or two of those. Um, the question was earlier, how did Ronald Reagan remain so consistent in the face of so much buffeting within our own government and so much violent opposition in the rest of the world? And my answer is twofold. One is that he wrote a lot. And if you want to figure out what you think about any great issue, write it. Mike Reagan told me that there was a period when Mike was staying at the house in Pacific Palisades, and whenever he would come home from high school, drop down his books, go in to say hello to his father, his father was always, always seated at the big desk in the master bedroom where he would be reading and writing. It is always to be borne in mind that for a good four decades before he became president of the United States, Ronald Reagan had thought through the great issues of the day in the medium of his own pen and paper. He knew his mind because he had spent decades thinking and writing. And then the second large point that it always seemed to me to be true as a speechwriter was that he was possessed, it's been commented on many times that he possessed a particularly vivid imagination. And that's often said to his detriment that he could write a, deliver a speech as if it were a scene in a play. Or I think that misses the point. He did possess a deep imagination, but it was a moral imagination. And so, he felt, well, we know, for example, that when Whitaker Chambers left the Communist Party, he wrote about this in his great book, Witness, he believed he was losing, he was leaving, rather, the winning side, the Communist side, to join the losing side. Jean-Francois Ravel wrote a book during the Reagan years called How Democracies Perish. Nixon and Kissinger made a calculated decision. They thought they were being grown-ups and making the wisest decision possible that the West was losing. And Ronald Reagan somehow could see a different ending. He was not going to play to that script. So when I went to Berlin to research the speech that I was assigned, the very first event, by the way, my total brief on going to Berlin from the White House senior staff was, he'll stand in front of the Berlin Wall, the Brandenburg Gate will be up behind him, audience of about 40,000, speak for about half an hour, subject foreign affairs. <laughs> so I flew to Berlin and went to the place he would speak. And it is, this is a problem for me because I have kids, my children. I think to myself, how does one, how do we communicate to them what it was like? to stand there, to go up on a platform and look over a wall and see guards and barbed wire and dogs. And in the historic center of East Berlin, damaged by war but still many beautiful buildings, almost no foot traffic, a dead city, one of the great capitals of Europe, dead. And then, then where the president would speak, the Reichstag, still damaged by war, the feeling of a kind of oppressiveness, a deadness, there in the heart of one of the great capitals of Europe. I don't know, it's a problem for me now how to communicate what it was like to coming generations. For me, as a young speechwriter, I, my problem was enormous. What could I say, what could I write that would be equal to the moment? because by then I knew Ronald Reagan and I knew that he would respond to this setting just as I <coughs> was responding to it. So there's a long story here, I won't go into it all, but I did meet a German woman and I was told, I had been told by the ranking American diplomat in Berlin, don't have Reagan sound like an anti-communist cowboy, nothing crude please, we're all sophisticated here. And by the way, Berliners have now gotten used to the wall so I said, 
I've been told that you're used to the wall. Is that so? This was at a dinner party. One man raised his arm and pointed and said, my sister lives just a few kilometers in that direction, but I haven't seen her in more than two decades. How do you think we feel about the wall? They went around the room, every person talking about the wall. Clearly, they developed a kind of polite protocol that they didn't talk about it to each other. But if you asked, they hated it every day. And then when Mrs. Eltz, lovely woman, became angry and said, this man Gorbachev, he can prove with the perestroika and the glasnost, if he's serious, he can come here and take down this wall. That went right into my notebook. And I knew at that moment, at that moment, because my boss was Ronald Reagan, that he, he would have responded to her and to that moment. So wrote the speech for the president. The president looked at it. The president said in front of staff, actually, I, I cued him up a little bit. I, we were always wanted more of Ronald Reagan in these speech meetings. And I explained that the speech would be heard on the other side, the communist side of the wall. Is there anything in particular, sir, that you'd like to say to those people? And he thought for a moment. And um, all of us who were close, we can all do these Ronald Reagans because we all inhabited his mind in some way. He thought, well, there's that, uh, there's that passage about tearing down the wall. That's what I want to say to them. That wall has to come down. And for three weeks, that passage was objected to by more or less the entire foreign policy apparatus of the United States government. <laughs> and in the final moment, Ken Duberstein, then the deputy chief of staff, sat the president down. I wasn't there for this, but Ken told me about it, and had him reread the passage. And Ken went through all the objections from state and national security council. He wanted to make sure the president understood. And they talked about it for a moment. And then Ken said there was a moment when the president, the twinkle came into the president's eye. And the president said, now, I'm the president, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, we're clear about that much. So I get to decide if that line stays in? <laughs> yes, sir, it's your decision. Well, then, it stays in. <laughs> so, <laughs> that. Please. What each of us has said in one way or another, unusually, actually, if you spend time on C-SPAN, watching staffers from former administrations. I think it's not unfair to say that there's quite a lot of jockeying about how much the staffers did and how little the presidents actually did. All the way across this podium this morning, what you're hearing is, it was Ronald Reagan. I couldn't have written that speech, wouldn't have written the speech for anyone else. I had worked for Vice President Bush, a very fine man. But I can tell you that the first time you handed him a speech that was on foreign policy, he would look at you and say, now you've cleared this with state, right? I would not have written that speech for George W. Bush, nor would any other figure have delivered it but Ronald Reagan. He was the one, he was the one who made it all, who sent those carrier groups who delivered that speech. It was Reagan. Mr. Allen wanted to add one thing. To drive the nail home on this, Peter, uh, in 1978, I proposed to the governor and Nancy that we go to Germany, um, that we start in England, stop in France, and go on to Germany. He had never been to Germany in his life by November 78 when the trip was planned. I studied in Germany. Pat and I lived there. Uh, our two children, two of our seven children are born there. One Munich girl is over here, our daughter Kristen, along with our other daughter Cass. Uh, we decided that this would be a good thing. So off we flew to London. Prime Minister Callahan didn't have time to see Ronald Reagan, so we were shuffled off to newly minted Foreign Secretary David Owen, who, among other things, while Pete Hannaford and I could con scarcely contain our laughter in a room, didn't get up to greet Governor Reagan when he came in, offered him a chair, and said, uh, tell me, Mr. Reagan, uh, what do you think of Mr. Ping? And the governor leaned in and said, pardon me? 
uh, what do you think of Mr. Ping? And the governor looked at me and I, I said, Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping. Oh, he said, Mr. Ping, yeah. Well, we got outside, couldn't contain our laughter out there. Uh, it was, after all, Mr. Deng and not Mr. Ping. Uh, went on to lunch with Margaret Thatcher uh, and then to some press people. Ed Fulner had arranged through his own contacts there. Over to Paris, President Giscard d'Estaing had no time for Ronald Reagan. Uh, neither did Prime Minister Raymond Barr. Jacques Chirac tried to see him, but Chirac broke his leg the day before and it didn't quite work out. So we went to the hospital with a box of dried fruit. And I asked to see Madame Chirac and she came out and said, yes, well, what is it? I said, this is Ronald Reagan. She said, who? I said, this is Ronald Reagan. Mm, I don't know, je ne sais pas. Um, handed him the fruit and uh, that was that. So we weren't having all that much success. <laughs> We got to Berlin and Helmut Schmidt, whom I had known from my days of study in Germany back in the late, uh, late 50s and early 60s, uh, gladly saw him. It was not a happy, particularly happy meeting. On to Berlin, Peter Hannaford, Irene Hannaford, my wife Pat, I, Nancy, and the governor. Got to Berlin and walked to the wall, went over to the wall, and he stood in front of the wall Pete on one side, Pete and Irene, and Pat and I on the other, and stood there, his jaw tensed, he looked at it, November 1978, and he turned to me and said, we've got to find a way to knock this thing down. Now, you think that this was a new, or some think, certainly not Peter or anyone else up here, thinks that that's a new idea. That idea was firmly entrenched. And I, when I talked to him about it later, the wall should have come down in August of 1961 when it went up without reaction from the United States. First as barbed wire and then as concrete blocks. Now one quick segue about consistency because Peter's made that point as well as others up here. Nine days after being inaugurated, there was a press conference, his first press conference in the East Room of the White House. Ed will remember we had a murder board. In fact, we had two murder boards. Murder boards, which Jimmy Carter refused to have because he didn't like to be challenged, I learned from Carter's advisors. Murder boards consist of a small number of staff, the candidate, the president, sitting across the table, and you ask him the dirtiest questions you can possibly imagine. Sam Donaldson type questions. You know? uh, and so we grilled him, grilled him all through Soviet policy, China, so on and so forth, all through the domestic issues which were taking precedence then, all through every other issue. Second murder board, the same thing. The press conference one e that evening, East Room of the White House, packed, just like this, semicircle like this. And so Al Haig and I weren't see that we were standing over to the side. I don't know where Ed was, but he was right nearby. We were standing on the side. And two thirds of the way through the press conference, there was a question about Soviet policy. And uh, President Reagan said, well, of course, we know that the Soviets will commit any crime, will lie and cheat to get what they want. <gasps> Collectively, the press. <laughs> and they looked around and they saw all of us, the staffers and whatnot, but Haig and I were in that, sort of that corner, and Haig was saying, oh my God. <laughs> and seeing Al do that, I just smiled and <laughs> right ahead. So there was a confusing reaction. After the press conference, the press rushes out. Some people scurry uh, to, to talk to Al, and the president starts to walk out, and I thread my way out behind him. Five paces behind him, walking across the colonnade past the Rose Garden, back to the Oval Office, and the president stopped, turned and wheeled, just a small coterie of Secret Service. I don't know how he knew I was behind him, but he turned and said, oh, say, Dick. I said, yes, sir. He said, the Soviets, they do lie, cheat, and steal to get what they want, don't they? <laughs> and I, I'll never forget that moment. <laughs> I said, 
yes, sir, they sure do. And he said, I thought so, and turned around. <laughs> 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 Amazing story, but true. <laughs> I, uh, I think it's very important we get to the next question because so many of us grew up under the threat of the Cold War, and today our children are growing up under the threat of terrorism, which is all too real, as we know just from recent days. Um, I had the pleasure yesterday of interviewing John O'Sullivan. He was a uh, former aide to Maggie Thatcher, and he wrote the book The President, the Pope, and the Prime Minister, three who changed the world. And this is how I introduced them very briefly. They were three middle managers no one imagined could ever reach the top. Ronald Reagan was too old to be president and too conservative anyway. Margaret Thatcher was not only too conservative, she was a woman and not on anyone's short list to lead Britain's conservative party. And the idea of a Polish pope was truly absurd, especially when the cardinal in question was a strong anti-communist. My question is this, Mr. Meese, I'll start with you. To what extent is President Reagan's life and thought shaped by the Cold War relevant today as we face this new major threat? Well, I think it's very relevant. Uh, we've talked about his consistency. Uh, one of the things, uh, and, and also uh, I particularly mentioned his vision. Uh, if, if a leader doesn't have a vision of where the country should be going, uh, then you're gonna drift. Uh, you're going to have to take a long time making decisions. You're going to be consulting all kinds of people. And uh, meanwhile, the situation gets worse. Uh, I think that Ronald Reagan's consistency, the fact that he had thought about these things over a long period of time, the fact that he had a vision uh, of uh, what to do, uh, I think all of these things, uh, uh, I think all of, he has, he made, is an example of any leader, what any leader ought to do, and particularly at a time of, uh, of very great change uh, in, the, in the situation that confronts the United States. Uh, the Soviet Union had been uh, a consistent threat to the United States since the end of World War II. Uh, today we have a rapidly changing threat in the sense of the tactics. We don't have the same kinds of uh, conventional battlefields and those kinds of things. And so you need, I think, even more to have a president who is consistent, who understands, who has that vision of where we ought to be going, uh, so that that can be adapted quickly to a very difficult and changing and complex situation. So I think Ronald Reagan's principles, if you look at the major principles of Ronald Reagan, uh, I've often talked about in terms of five different principles. Uh, number one, that he had a vision. Uh, as he expressed to, to Dick in, in those terms, he had a vision of what to do with the Soviet Union. Secondly, he had the ability to communicate that vision and get the country behind him uh, in support of that, of turning that vision into strategies, policies, and actions. The third thing that he had uh, was a tremendous political courage. Uh, the things that he did, for example, the, the first major test of Ronald Reagan uh, really was uh, about eight months after he took office when the professional air traffic controllers went on strike. And uh, everybody said, uh, he should follow, and I will say everybody, but a, a number of people thought he would just follow the usual pattern, uh, let him go on strike, and ultimately that'll get negotiated and they'll come back. Uh, Ronald Reagan took the position it was against the law for them to strike, and it was against the law for their union to support such a strike. And he said, I've got, I am sworn to enforce the law. Now, Ronald Reagan, as all of us who worked with him know, hated to fire anybody. Uh, it was a uh, probably the most difficult thing to get him to do would be to fire anybody who deserved it even. But, uh, but, but what he said was, he went on television, he said, I'm giving you 48 hours to return to work. If you don't return to work, then you have forfeited your job and you're through. And he said, and the union, unless they uh, stop the strike, the union will be disbarred uh, from ever uh, representing employees again. Well, uh, the press, like uh, has been talked about here, all the bureaucrats said, you just can't do this. Planes will fall, fall out of the sky, air travel, travel will be up, up, uh, uprooted for, for weeks, and uh, Ronald Reagan held firm. As a result of that, of course, <clears throat> he used military tra traffic controllers, he used the supervisors, he used those small fa fraction that did come back to work, and uh, it, within a couple of days, air traffic uh, was back to normal, and in fact, he had won. Uh, he had won because he upheld the law. And this gets back to this point of consistency. But that took tremendous political courage. Uh, when he supported the freedom fighters in Nicaragua, 
against the Speaker of the House and against uh, most all the news media in the country. Uh, that took tremendous political courage. A fourth thing that, that he always was an example of was integrity. The reason he got along so well with Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, Gorbachev knew that if he said something, uh, he would live up to his word, whatever that happened to be. Uh, and the fifth thing was perseverance. Uh, he, once he set a goal, he would keep after that goal. And as he used to say, I'll take half a loaf if that's all I can get, and then I'll go back and try and get the rest. Well, uh, these qualities of Ronald Reagan are as necessary today as they've ever been. And particularly this ability to show the, the, the country uh, that there is a way to handle these tremendous problems. And I think that uh, he applied the same kind of vision uh, to the other problems we faced at that time, the economy, for example, uh, regaining our world leadership. Uh, and so I, I think Ronald Reagan is as relevant today, the principles he stood for, uh, and the example that he set. It's interesting to me to note uh, that in the 2008 election, in the debates, in both the Republican and the Democrat debates, the person who was most spoke, spoken about as a previous president was Ronald Reagan. And I think that uh, his, his example, his principles, uh, and what he stood for is as relevant today as it was then. Uh, Secretary Lehman, the general spoke about the battlefield today. Aircraft carriers, to an extent, don't work anymore, do they? <laughs> well, like democracy, they, they don't work so well, but they work better than anything else. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and Ronald Reagan understood that. And while this, uh, again, I, I don't want to sound paranoid, but as Kister used to say, uh, even paranoids have some real opponents. And uh, President Reagan had a real opponent in the permanent government in Washington. And as Secretary Schultz would uh, aver, I'm sure, the most uh, embedded and difficult to move bureaucracy is the vast sea of joint staffs uh, that run our defense policy. And uh, they did not like, that permanent bureaucracy did not like aircraft carriers or battleships. They're provocative. They're they go into harm's way, uh, and uh, constant uh, efforts were made during the Reagan years to drop this 600-ship Navy. Why these aircraft carriers, they're, they're, they don't work anymore. Get rid of them. It's too much money. And so while the president was very much involved in, in uh, uh, other things with the Soviets during 83, we had budget cuts. Out came a directive to say we will start dropping aircraft carriers from the 15 that uh, President Reagan had, had done and drop the 600-ship Navy. Let's start retiring some of these battleships. And that was a directive that came approved by the chiefs, approved by Cap was over on a Japan trip, but the new DEPSEC DEF, uh, Paul Thayer, had signed this out. And it was to be implemented. And. Uh, uh, we, I was able to bring this to the attention through some of the uh, usual suspects uh, of the president. And so two days later, the president goes out and makes a speech in which he hand wrote in, we must have a 600-ship Navy with 15 carrier battle groups. And of course, the chiefs went, what's going on here? But he never wavered, and that, you know, uh, the, the, the secret of success, as Margaret Thatcher used to frequently say, is constancy of purpose. And that was the great strength of, of uh, President Reagan. He, it, it, it's not stubbornness. It has nothing to do with stubbornness. It has to do with a valid intellectual framework uh, and calmly sticking to it and not be moved off. I saw it work. Uh, in not so good an outcome during the same time period. When we lost 241 Marines <coughs> killed by Hezbollah uh, in 1983, just about two weeks ago uh, uh, in October, it was the anniversary. The president's reaction, first of all, we now, uh, much of the classified information has been released on this tragic accident. We have, it came out in a trial and was declassified. We had, at the moment, we had intercepted the order from Iran, from the, uh, uh, from the Ayatollahs, to implement the attack on the 
American Marines. We knew where the planner was. We knew where the implementers from the Syrian uh, Defense Ministry were. Uh, and the, uh, there was immediately a plan put in place to retaliate because the president said uh, within hours of the attack, we must retaliate. We cannot allow this, this, uh, 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 this terrible attack on the United States who is there as a peacekeeper, not as a combatant. We've lost 241 American kids and we are going to retaliate. Well, we never did retaliate because the bureaucracy just kept, they didn't want to retaliate. Uh, in fact, we had worked out a joint plan with the French and because they had lost 80 some uh, of their uh, combatants, uh, peacekeepers in the same uh, mode. There was a full blown strike ready to go, wiping out the, uh, the uh, Hezbollah training base at Belbek where all of the, uh, the attackers had come from, where there was gonna be a snatch of the three um, uh, the three uh, 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 key operatives that from the uh, Iranian uh, uh, Revolutionary Guard and the two Syrians, and there were to be two Tomahawk cruise missiles, which were on the New Jersey at the time, sitting offshore, targeted on the corner office of the Defense Ministry in Damascus. All was needed was the the approval, and without going into the gory details, which have been written about elsewhere, the bureaucracy just refused to do it because they felt it was provocative, it was uh, warmongering, we didn't have enough evidence here or enough evidence there, and uh, uh, it, it was a, a sad result. It is not Ronald Reagan's fault because he never wavered. We must retaliate but he had so many other distractions at the time that he couldn't pull the trigger himself and it never happened. And clearly in our 9-11 investigation, that was a major sea change in Osama bin Laden's mind. He referred to it all the time. You see, the Americans can't, don't even have this, the uh, strength of will when, when hundreds of their children, he said, are killed, they, they're afraid to, to take action, and that gave him huge encouragement. Uh, so it, it, it was uh, uh, just an example of one of the very few times that Ronald Reagan's constancy of purpose never wavered, but was not uh, sufficiently strong to overcome the combined opposition of the joint bureaucracy, the diplomatic bureaucracy, and uh, the NATO bureaucracy. Mr. Allen, I'm hearing purpose and perseverance here from these two gentlemen. Um, is that what Ronald Reagan would do today, persevere with our allies in the Middle East to help counter this terrorism and put an end to it? <clears throat> I expected this kind of question this morning, uh, but didn't prepare for it. Uh, however, <laughs> um, I think there's no question but that he would have urged that kind of uh, consistency of purpose because it was in him, in him. I always thought that the role of, a, of an efficient, hardworking advisor should not be to tell a, a president, a chief executive officer or president exactly what to do or whisper in his ear as a, as a court advisor would and persuade him to do one thing or the other rather to fill in the details again, to give him all of the information and let him make his decision. This is the way I know that my colleagues here approached uh, President Reagan. He had that infrastructure in mind, that constancy of purpose, knew what he wanted to do and would pursue it. Uh, John tells that amazing story I have another involving the rescue of some people that we believed were still held hostage uh, in, um, in Southeast Asia, still Vietnam War uh, prisoners. Uh, we had photographic evidence and uh, put together a team and were ultimately betrayed, not by anyone else except, I think, the inefficiency of a bureaucracy that refused to move 
and the president was uh, on that case virtually every day. So this, this constancy of purpose is striking, not easily deflected. Now, on the other hand, I think Ed made reference earlier, and Ed was, of course, with him when he was governor of California. He knew when to make a deal. He knew when the best deal possible was available. So that even when, toward the end, when he was in deep negotiations and important ones uh, with Mikhail Gorbachev, uh, there were people who began to, or who would attack him for having caved to Gorbachev. No such thing happened. Ronald Reagan didn't cave on matters of principle. Uh, we can all attest to that. Matters of principle counted more than anything else. And when it came to safeguarding the lives of Americans, uh, there was no one to compare. No one to compare. Uh, one quick anecdote. Uh, the day after the hostages were released in uh, 1981, uh, on, on his inauguration, I learned from a staffer that there was yet another hostage uh, in Iran, and it was someone named Cynthia Dwyer. Now, she wasn't part of the embassy staff. Uh, she was a freelance journalist who was interested in peace and went to Iran and was nabbed and kept with them, but she wasn't released with the embassy hostages. In the meantime, Ed and I and others were negotiating on the release of the Iranian assets, which ran to the billions. They had been sequestered, and we were part of the deal was that they would have these assets returned. The president said, the deal's off, when I told him that there was a Cynthia Dwyer. Uh, I said, that's going to be difficult. He said, just let it be known that the deal could be off if, if we don't get Mrs. Dwyer back. So I let it be known that the deal might be off anonymously, and it got out a little bit in the press. The next day, Cynthia Dwyer was taken to the airplane, but refused to get on until they returned her camera. <laughs> so they scurried, they held the plane, and Cynthia Dwyer got the camera, and off she went. I never heard from Cynthia Dwyer again. About four years later, I was on the, the McNeil uh, 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 the News Hour with Rob McNeil and Jim Lehrer, and someone mentioned about Ronald Reagan not having any heart for human beings, individuals, any concern for them, and I told the story of Cynthia Dwyer. The next day in my office, which was about three blocks from the White House, I got a call saying, Dick, is that you? I said, yes. It's John Dwyer. John? John Dwyer from Notre Dame? the guy that had the, the room right next to mine on Green Phillips Hall on the third floor? Yes, John, John, that's my wife, Cynthia, you were talking about last night. <laughs> I said, it is? I said, yeah, I said, I'm a professor at SUNY, State University of New York, and uh, she's been attacking Ronald Reagan ever since she's been back. Uh, so these years, she's still in the peace movement, and she, is that true? And I said, yes, it's true, of course. She said, oh my God, what's she going to do? And I said, don't worry about it. So I called uh, the White House, got the president to return my call, and told him the story. He said, really? I said, yes. <laughs> he said, what's her telephone number? <laughs> I gave him the number, hung up. About an hour later, I get a call. It's Cynthia Dwyer. Dick Allen, we've never met, but oh my God, I picked up the phone. It was Ronald Reagan. Oh my God. <laughs> What am I going to do now? I said, you have to do the right thing. Constancy of purpose. Get Cynthia Dwyer back. Of course, it was a major coincidence that she happened to be the wife of a next-door neighbor at Breen Phillips Hall on the third floor in 1940-53 at South Bend, Indiana. But that re represented, among other things, a singular instance of constancy of purpose. Peter, what would uh, Ronald Reagan suggest you write today to respond to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda and everybody else that wants to attack Western countries and values? That would be a pretty rough speech. <clears throat> I think he'd, he'd lay into them. 
he would lay into them. Um, I'm struck again and again going back over his speeches uh, beginning in 1964. Incidentally, this is an important point, and it's an important point for a speechwriter to make. During the eight years of his presidency, there were 14 of us who went through his office as speechwriters to the president. But he always sounded like Ronald Reagan. There was no sense ever in which any one of us was putting words in his mouth. We were always taking from Ronald Reagan himself the point of view, the style, even the rhythm he used in speaking before he became president and giving it back to himself. But I'm, I'm struck, this, this is a tr tricky, you know, at some absurd level you could say, what would George Washington think about the health care plan? I mean, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so but, but I do think we, we know, we can say this much about what Ronald Reagan would have counseled us to do now in foreign policy. Two points, two simple points about which I, f I think this is right. I think I'll you'll let you fellows check me, but I think we can feel fairly certain about both of these. One is he would still have believed in peace through strength. And you, Ed, told me once that when, when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General Vesey, was briefing the president in the Situation Room, you were there on the Grenada invasion, the president said, how many troops do you need, troops and sailors? And there was an answer. And then Ronald Reagan said, take that number and double it. There will be fewer casualties on both sides. Now, you have, you have that. And then we have unfolding in our public life at the moment, the commander on the ground in Afghanistan has said to the commander in chief, I need 40,000 more troops. And the commander in chief has said, we'll get back to you on that one. That, that would have been inconceivable in Ronald Reagan's White House. The other, The, the second point that I, th I think we'd all agree on, by the way, correct me, I know you don't, you're not bashful, you'll correct me if you think I'm making a mistake here, but his intense focus, particularly during the first year or year and a half on the economy. Now, and incidentally, the political risks he was willing to run. Let Volcker crank down on the money supply, we're gonna take a recession, that's all right. If it has to be done, it has to be done because he understood that our underlying economic strength was related to our place in the world. And the notion that an administration now runs around the world apologizing for every American policy, tries to suggest that it's going to be strong here and strong there, and yet at home it has produced a $900 trillion stimulus bill which represents at least an $850 billion fraud on the American public. I haven't heard anybody argue that more than about 50 or 80 billion of that could any, in any way be called a stimulus, that we have a 1,900-page health care. This is a kind of madness that the, the President Reagan... President, President Reagan would have taken seriously. I believe he would have taken it as his first item of business in his first year in office to address himself to this economic mess, and he wouldn't do it by printing money and passing enormous bills, in my humble opinion.